Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're going to take a look at an overview of metabolism. And I think the best way to do this is to address the key points and terms that you'll be assessed on in a metabolism and biochemistry exam. And these terms have popped up in the box here. So we're going to cover in around about 10 to 15 minutes, these points, which often take two or more hours in a lecture. So we're gonna look at glycolysis, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis. Those words are starting to sound the same now. Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, lipogenesis, lipolysis, ketogenesis, and ketolysis. Let's start. Where do we begin? We begin with a delicious cheeseburger. You take that bite and you ingest it. And we know that cheeseburgers are gonna contain all those important macronutrients. Those macronutrients include carbohydrates, so carbs, they include proteins, and they include triglycerides. So let's write that down. Triglycerides, so the fats. So we've got our carbs, our proteins, and our fats that we've now introduced into our gastrointestinal tract. Importantly, you should be aware that carbohydrates are simply made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Proteins are made up of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogen. And triglycerides are made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, much like the carbohydrates. So your question may be, well, what's the difference? Well, for carbs, the amount of carbons and oxygens are in an, a, pretty much an equivalent ratio. But for triglycerides, the carbons and the hydrogens far exceed the amount of oxygens. And it's actually this reduced number of oxygen is the reason why triglycerides don't like water. All right, you've ingested it into the gastrointestinal tract. In your mouth, the saliva contains an enzyme called amylase that breaks down the carbs into your micronutrient version of this macronutrient, which we're gonna focus on here, which is going to be glucose. And let's write that glucose as G. The proteins, once that hits the stomach, you've got hydrochloric acid that unfolds these proteins, but you've also got pepsin, which is a protease, molecular scissors, that starts to chop it up. So we digest those proteins into amino acids. Amino acids. And we'll write that as AA. And then once we hit the small intestines, the very first part called the duodenum, with the help of bile to break it down a little bit and lipases, the enzyme that breaks down fats, we now release or produce, I should say, glycerol and fatty acids. So both glycerol and fatty acids together make up triglycerides. Now what's happening? This is in the gastrointestinal tract still. Once it reaches the intestines, the glucose will get absorbed into the bloodstream, specifically the portal system that goes to the liver. The proteins, or I should say the amino acids there that have been digested, they get absorbed at the small intestines, also into the bloodstream, specifically that portal system as well, going to the liver. But the triglycerides being broken down into glycerol and fatty acids, they actually get absorbed not into that bloodstream, they get absorbed into the lymphatic system. And that lymphatic system will distribute the glycerol and fatty acids to different tissues of the body, but also it ultimately ends up in the liver as well. So that's why I've drawn up this monster liver here, because at the end of the day, all these micronutrients are making it to the liver. What happens metabolically to them? Let's first start with glucose. When glucose enters the liver, it can undergo a couple of different things. One, we can store that glucose, and we store that glucose in the form of glycogen. So you can store the glucose as glycogen. Now that's important because, now, glucose, glycogen, glucagon, glycerol, all these words sort of sound the same. Remember this, if it ends in O-G-E-N, it means it's stored and it's inactive. So glycogen is the stored and active form of glucose. And this process of storing glycogen from glucose is called glycogenesis. Glycogenesis. Glyco. -genesis. Glyco -genesis. 
Genesis. Let's have a look here, right? Glycogenesis. That Genesis means the beginning of. Glycogen, Genesis, it's the beginning of glycogen. So we're storing that. We can also take that glycogen and split it apart to release glucose if we like to. And this process of taking the glycogen, splitting it apart back into glucose, is called glycogenolysis. The term or suffix lysis means to split apart. So that's called glycogenolysis, splitting it apart. So now we've got free glucose. Now this free glucose, if we want to utilize it to make energy in the form of ATP, this is what it does. The glucose will turn into something called pyruvate. And the process in which glucose turns into pyruvate is called glycolysis. So we've already covered a couple of things here. We've covered glycogenesis, we've covered glycogenolysis, and we've covered glycolysis, the first three. Pyruvate, what does pyruvate do? Pyruvate will enter the mitochondria and in the mitochondria, it will turn into something called acetyl-CoA. Let's draw the mitochondria up. We know it's this double membraned structure that's super important for us. So let's draw that up. There's one membrane and now let's do the other membrane. There we go, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Now, once acetyl-CoA is in that mitochondria, with the help of its best friend, oxaloacetate, it undergoes this cycle where it produces a whole bunch of substrates, and this is called the Krebs cycle. Now, it's got many names. It's not just called the Krebs cycle. It's also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle and the citric acid cycle, but let's just write Krebs cycle here. We've skipped gluconeogenesis, we'll get there I promise. What's the whole point of this Krebs cycle? Why are we taking glucose through glycolysis through Krebs cycle? Ultimately because we want to produce two important things. We want to produce NADH and we want to produce FADH2. What do these two things do? Well, in this mitochondrial inner membrane, you're going to have a couple of important proteins and channels. One, two, three, four, and then I'm going to draw a last one like this. This is called the electron transport chain. And the reason why is because the Krebs cycle, and even glycolysis to a degree, right? Even glycolysis will produce NADH. What these things do is they hold on to hydrogen ions and they hold on to electrons. That's important. And when they hold on to these things, once they're produced, they will release those electrons. They will release the hydrogen ions. And what happens is the electrons will get thrown through this chain from one to the next, like a little game of hot potato with these electrons. Hence why it's called the electron transport chain. Cha-ching, right there. It's passing it, I'll stand over here. It's passing it from one side to the next. And in doing so, it produces the capacity of some of these proteins to take hydrogen and throw them across the membrane into the intermembrane space. Take some of that hydrogen, throw it into this space. Now what's gonna happen? We're going to accumulate hydrogen in this space and the hydrogen diminishes here. So there's a concentration difference. A lot of hydrogen here, not much hydrogen here. So this hydrogen wants to go down its concentration gradient and it does so here through this thing called an ATP synthase. So piggybacking on the energy of the hydrogen ion diffusion, this thing produces ATP. It produces huge amounts of ATP. So at the end of the day, the whole point of us having this glucose is to undergo this process to produce all of this ATP. Brilliant. But something I didn't mention is that in order for this to happen, we need oxygen.
oxygen needs to be utilized in this process. If we don't have oxygen, we can't produce ATP through this electron transport chain. It's called oxidative phosphorylation. So sometimes you'll do really vigorous, intense exercise really quickly, like a 100 meter sprint, or jump into the gym and lift some weights really hard and really fast, and you wanna create more ATP than oxygen available. So think about it. You go through this process, goes like this, you got this, but we need oxygen. We don't have enough. You can't breathe enough of that oxygen in. Enough oxygen can't be delivered to the mitochondria fast enough. So it goes, uh, backs up, backs up, backs up to this pyruvate. And so the pyruvate goes, it's all right, I'll figure this out. Now we used to think that the pyruvate turned into lactic acid, lactic acid. And because the definition of an acid is something that releases hydrogen ions, right, and then produces its relevant base, which is lactate, we used to think that this is the process and it's those hydrogen ions that give us that burning sensation when you do that type of exercise. But now what we're thinking is this isn't the case. We don't really think that there's that lactic acid that's being produced. We think that it's actually lactate that's directly been produced. And we're not releasing hydrogen ions. The lactate can actually absorb those hydrogen ions and buffer them out. So lactate may actually be the friend in this process. Amazingly, once we've got enough oxygen back into the system, the lactate can reversibly turn into pyruvate. Wonderful. All right. Now, the whole purpose of doing this is it actually, so when I say we produce NADH, for example, we actually produce it from something called NAD+. NAD plus goes to NADH. What this process does of going from, from pyruvate to lactate is it actually produces some NADH, uh, NAD plus for us, which is good because we can use that here in the process of glycolysis, for example. And then going backwards, it produces NADH, which can be utilized to produce energy here in the electron transport chain. All right, now we've spoken about this process, but we haven't even touched upon amino acids, glycerol, and fatty acids. Where do they fit in? Well, it's a beautiful process. When we bring these amino acids in, and you know there's heaps of different types of amino acids, right? I said that for glucose, if we don't want to produce energy, we store it as glycogen. What about amino acids? Well, we don't really store excess amino acids. We deaminate it and we pee it out as urea, right? We deaminate it into ammonia, pee it out as urea. Some amino acids will be synthesized into proteins, but other amino acids will actually jump into, depending on, remember there's like 20 different types of amino acids. Some will jump into glycolysis, some will jump into the Krebs cycle. Awesome. Glycerol and fatty acids. The glycerol that comes in, what does that do? Well, it can jump into glycolysis. That's pretty cool. And the fatty acids that come in, they can jump into the Krebs cycle. So, the triglycerides, glycerol fatty acids, can feed into glycolysis, feed into the Krebs cycle, and help produce ATP. The amino acids can do the same, help produce ATP. Why would we need to use these when we've got glucose? Well, we use these when, predominantly, we don't have any glucose that's available. We've used all our glucose stores or are intentionally not using glucose. Think about this. When we don't have glucose, glycolysis isn't happening, there's not enough pyruvate, there's not enough acetyl-CoA, oxaloacetate goes, well, I've got nothing to bind with. I can actually jump out and start to produce more pyruvate here. I can try and produce some glucose through this process, right? So that means oxaloacetate, it diminishes. But if you're doing that, you're producing acetyl-CoA and now you don't have oxaloacetate to bind to. So acetyl-CoA levels start to go up when you don't have any glucose. And what does that mean? Well, if you've got accumulating, I'm sorry for all these arrows, if you accumulate all this acetyl-CoA, they actually snap together like Lego blocks and they produce something called ketones. What do ketones do? Ketones can jump out of the liver, into the bloodstream, go to the brain, and what's it gonna do in the brain? It turns back into acetyl-CoA. And when it turns back into acetyl-CoA, it can undergo this 
process. This process of turning acetyl-CoA into ketones in the absence of glucose, right? Because again, what happened? No glucose, no pyruvate, no acetyl-CoA, oxaloacetate goes, well, let's try and make some glucose from, from me, jumps out. But then the acetyl-CoA that's produced doesn't have its friend to bind with, so accumulates, snaps together, forms ketones like beta-hydroxybutyrate, and this process is known as ketogenesis. That's one of the words in the box, right? Ketogenesis, where's that? Down here, ketogenesis. Now, once the ketones get out of the liver, cross the blood-brain barrier, go to the brain, and turn into acetyl-CoA, this is called ketolysis. We're now splitting apart the ketones into acetyl-CoA, ketolysis. Oxaloacetate isn't the only thing that tries to replenish this lost glucose. Have a look. Amino acids are trying to replenish this lost glucose, jumping into various aspects of glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Glycerol is trying to do the same as well, and fatty acids are jumping into the Krebs cycle here at the level of acetyl-CoA. This process of taking amino acids, glycerol, and to some degree fatty acids, these are non-carbohydrate-based sources, but we're trying to produce glucose here, or at least glucose substrates. This is called gluconeogenesis. So this process here and here, predominantly, and a little bit here, but also through ketones, this is called gluconeogenesis. Now, gluco means glucose, neo means new, genesis means the beginning of, read it backwards, the beginning of new glucose. Gluconeogenesis is the beginning of new glucose from non-carbohydrate-based sources like amino acids and fats. Brilliant. Now, the last thing we haven't spoken about is lipogenesis and lipolysis. Very simple. I said what happens when you have excess glucose stored as glycogen. Excess amino acids peed out as urea or can feed into this system. Glycerol and fatty acids, what happens when you have too much of that? Well, they can bind back together again, right? they can come back together to form the triglycerides. And we can store those triglycerides in the liver. This is known as lipogenesis, which makes sense, right? I've defined genesis now. Lipogenesis is the formation of lipo, right? Lipo, what's that? Lipids, right? Triglycerides, lipogenesis. And then splitting it apart and going in the opposite direction here, going in that opposite direction, that's gonna be lipolysis, breaking apart. So let's write lipolysis as well. And so what we've done here is hopefully, helpfully, we've gone through all these important points that you get assessed on in biochemistry and metabolism exams and assignments, for example, and we've run through an overview of metabolism. I hope that helps. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video and want to watch more, please hit the like and subscribe button.